This is The Mud Peddlers, a podcast where two nerdy ceramic artists share the behind the scenes of their worlds of play. We are your hosts, Lindsay M. Dillon. And I am Dante of Earth Nation. Okay, okay, how do we do this again? All right. It's already on. This week, (laughs) this week on The Mud Peddlers, we are talking about, well, a couple different things. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be talking a bit about heat work. That's the primary. That's the primary thing. And then Dante's got some exciting news. I do have some exciting news, and it comes on the back of the previous news that you heard. Yeah, we actually, uh, we kind of do a lot of news now. There's been a lot of changes. Ch-ch-ch-changes. You had your voice I don't know the words. I don't, I don't know. even know what song you are talking about. I feel like I know. I feel like you know a different... I'm thinking of a different ch-ch-ch-ch-changes song. I'm think... thinking of the... Da, 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 I thought you were talking da, 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 about the ch 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 You got your mother's ass. That guy? Oh, that's a different one, yes. Just yes. the same beat? Yeah. Speaking yeah. of artists da, da, stealing da, da, from da, each other. Da, 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 to real? Yes, that one. Da, 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 so jaded. Oh my God. Wow. To be young again. To be young again. We're sorry, guys. <laughs> Anyway, all right, so why don't we get started on our discussion of heat work? Okay, so today we are talking about heat work, and we just, before we get into this, we want to give a giant shout out to Sue McLeod. As always. As always. Sue McLeod and Digital Fire, because both Sue McLeod and Digital Fire had some great articles that we yes. looked into to kind of make sure we were getting our definitions right, because, um, but yeah. yeah, but we want to thank Sue McLeod and Digital Fire for providing the uh, kind of references for what some of what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, heat work and temperature are, are two different things, and we just want to kind of lay that down. Because I feel like as potters, mm. culturally we use the word heat work as like some some like weird uh, blob of definitions that no one really knows. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like everyone agrees to the terms and services of what they think <laughs> it means. You know, so like, yeah. oh yeah, the heat work in my kiln is different from yours because they're different sizes. Okay, yeah. why? Well, they just are. What do you mean they just are? You gotta tell me what that is. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, so yeah. So we're gonna try and put it down. Uh, we're gonna put try and... Put it down on me. Put it down on... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You good? No. Going through a lot of MTV. I am going through a lot of MTV. Right. I think it's because the, maybe the coffee's... Kicking in a little bit. We're going to lay it down and work it out like a sit-up right now. Yeah. In our birthday suits? No. (laughs) But it's hot. It is hot. Yeah, it is. The heat, talk about heat work. The heat work in this garage is turning us into soup. Oh, we're just dads now? Talk about heat work. (laughs) It's a scorcher in the kiln. It's a scorcher. Yep. Sacramento Sacramento kind of is a kiln. Yeah. It is a little bit. We are in a valley. Yeah, you're right. Okay, (laughs) okay. All right. Okay, go. So. (laughs) You go for, Lindsay, Lindsay, what is the difference In between heat work and temperature. Let's go with that. Okay. All right. So I am not reading off of a specific definition right now, but this is kind of me attempting to ad lib how I understand the differences. So the temperature is just that. It is a certain degree of heat. And now heat work has to do more with like how the temperature reacts to different factors in the kiln and essentially how that then impacts your work. So uh, there are like a number of different things that can impact the heat work, but a great metaphor that showed up on Sue McLeod's article, which again, y'all should definitely go and read this because she also gets into a lot of more specific information about pyrometric cones, but, but a metaphor that showed up on, uh, on her article and also on Digital Fire was essentially comparing kilns to ovens. Like if you were to put a batch of cookies into the oven, if you don't preheat your oven, that's going to impact how those cookies turn out. So if you preheat your oven, you're putting those cookies in, the cookies are essentially meeting 400 degree air, and then they start cooking, right? But if you don't preheat your oven and you just put your cookie dough in the oven and then crank up your oven to 400 degrees, your cookies are going to cook differently. Right. And a lot of the way that I think about heat work personally is is basically through the cookie example, right? Like, Like you do have to remember that from even a glaze and cooking point of view, that all the reactions in either the oven or the kiln are just chemical reactions that are put underneath the energy of heat, right? So that sounds super complicated, but realistically, if the recipe says put the cookies in the oven at 400 degrees for 10 minutes, people who are experienced at making cookies know that that's not really a true barometer of how you're cooking cookies. Yeah. What I do, personally, when I make cookies, 
is I put them at 400 degrees for 10 minutes. That is the temperature. That is the time. That is what they need to cook at that level. Mm -hmm. But they're not done cooking at that level. I then turn the oven off and let the residual heat in the oven continue to cure and cook the cookies. Mm. That's the leftover heat work. Yeah. The amount of heat that is given to the specific product at a certain amount of time in a specific way. That's what I consider heat work. That's a really good definition. And if you've ever tried to make cheesecake, you know that... Uh, you know. You know. You know. Huh. A lot of people in industry say that this is like the cure time. Yeah. You know, like when you glue something together, you can't just glue it together and then take it apart. You mm -hmm. have to kind of let the reactions happen, right? Yeah. So you have to set it down and kind of let it stick, kind of let it settle, let it cure for lack of a better term. And that's kind of how I think of heat work in my own kiln. A good example of this is I have my tester kiln, my little yes. my little scut firebox that I do a lot of my tests in. I'm very aware that that small amount of space cools down faster than my large 1027, KMT 1027, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So if I do a tester in that kiln, in the small kiln, and I get a good glaze out of it, I know that it's going to come out a tiny bit different than it will in the yeah, big kiln. Yeah, yeah. Because I, it cools down so much faster. The heat work is different. But in the big kiln, it holds so much more heat and energy for a longer period of time because there's so much of it, it takes more time to cool down. And that residual heat does affect the chemistry of my glazes. I've had a similar thing happen. And to me, like... When, when people talk about ceramics, you know, when you put something into a kiln, it's kind of like, well, you never know what's going to come out. Right. While there are some firings, like, you know, if you're doing like a soda firing, a wood firing, like, yeah, there are so many different more elements of chance. But if you are getting big differences in how your glazes turn out in, you know, in oxidation electric firings, I feel like the biggest variability there is with the heat work. You know, let's say you've been, you know, firing your work in your community college's kilns, and then you switch to like a different like studio kiln. That's why you might get different results with the same glazes because the chemistry of the glaze is not changing, but the heat work introduces another element that could make those changes. And like, I remember noticing that a lot. The very first time that I did a, a set of serveware for a cafe, I noticed that, so I use the same glaze, weathered bronze, love that glaze. And... I noticed that when I was firing it in my small kiln, my uh, Scut KM818, the color of the glaze had a much more warm kind of tone to it. Yeah. It was a lot more like, it was more of a yellow green than a blue green, if that makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. And then when I, I was running up against a deadline and for the next batch, I got it fired at Alpha Fired Arts. Yeah. And because their kilns are so much bigger and therefore like cool down a lot more slowly, I was getting a much more cool tone showing up on that glaze yep. because of that. So, it, and it's not even like you didn't there change was, anything in the recipe. You no, know, it didn't change anything in the same recipe. Same clay body. Same clay body. Yep. And it was just that, that slower cool time. And it's not like they had, you know, cause you can program a slow, a, a cool. slow cool. Right. These kilns did not have a program slow cool. It's just that it took so much longer for it to cool down that it essentially had a slow cooling effect right. on that glaze. Right. And that, that residual heat that's left over is, essentially the heat work right even if you took a big kiln to cone six and it dropped off the amount of residual heat in there that's especially affected by other pieces yeah so yeah. technically speaking if you had one piece in a kiln mm -hmm. let's say you put it in your what well, do you have an eight it's got a km 818 if you yeah. had it in the 818 of just one piece technically it's going to cool down faster than if it was surrounded by a bunch of other ceramic pieces that hold enough heat to keep that atmosphere, at least the space in the kiln, a little hotter than it otherwise would be. Yeah. Right? So te like technically speaking, if you put one piece in a kiln and you fired it off, yeah. right, with nothing that's, else around it. That's going to have different heat work. It's going to have different heat work. And it's going to cool down way faster yeah. than if, you're, if you had a full load. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As I do, I made a small list of like some of the biggest things that impact heat work. So I put down small versus large kilns. So that's kind of like what we were talking about with your tester kiln versus... That's a big one for me. Yeah, yeah. I think that especially the tester kilns, like part of me is like, why do you even have a tester kiln if you know that it's going to look different? Yeah. But so that's, that's one thing. Then tightly packed versus loosely packed kilns is another big one. Mm -hmm. Another big one is whether you are firing your work with a hold. So like with the pieces that I was making for the cafe, one of the other things that I didn't realize was affecting the glaze color is is that so I, I was having some issues with pitting and in, in the glazes itself and so to try and fix it I uh, fired my pieces to cone six and then put it on like I think a 15 or 30 minute like hold mm. and 
I did not realize, and it was actually, again, folks at Alpha who who were essentially saying, like, oh, so if you were, even though you're firing to cone six, yeah. that's all, because you have that hold, you're almost getting the heat work of cone seven. Yeah. And so you're kind of, like, over firing the pieces, and that's another thing that could be giving you that different effect of the glaze. Right. So whether you're holding your kiln at peak temperature is another thing. Same with like how quickly you, your kiln gets to temperature. Like, are you, uh, are you like again, just even on like the scuts, like, are you doing a fast firing, a medium yeah. firing, or like a slow firing? I have to do a slow firing in my tester kiln. Yeah. Because the heat work is so bad in it that I actively have to fire slower mm. so that on the way up, the chemical reaction that would be happening, in, hap- you know what I mean? Yeah. Because so 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 you so you essentially have to fire your t- tester kiln slow slowly to get it to try and match how it would normally look in your standard size kiln. Which it doesn't, by the way. Okay. I want to make that very clear. It do- it doesn't match. Okay. But I'm trying to facsimile it to a certain degree. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. And the portion partially the reason I have a tester kiln is because even though it has bad heat work, it still tells me like seventy percent of what's gonna happen in the big kiln. Mm. It usually just works better in the big kiln. Yeah. Right? And imagine it this way. You have a glaze that works at cone six. You fire it to cone six, and some people have a hold on there. Most of you have a hold because you're trying to like cure something you're trying to like get rid of pain or something like that but it will have an effect on the glaze yeah. which also doesn't always work like it, it i will say if you're work. having issues with pitting there are other things you can do but that's another conversation yeah but like imagine this right you have a glaze that works at cone six and it comes up the color you want it to at cone six mm-hmm. you put a little hold on it, it might change the color a little bit but it's not like the chemicals or the chemistry in the glaze all of a sudden goes oh okay we reached the proper temperature and the color that we want, guys. Mm-hmm. Let's all stop reacting to the amount of energy and heat in the kiln now. Mm-hmm. Let's all just give up, right? Like, yeah. if you held it there for a longer period of time, that amount of heat is still going to have effect on the chemistry and the glaze itself. The chemistry in the glaze, right? Yeah. So, like, let's say it goes from 2200 to 2000 in the course of, and I'm making numbers up here, mm-hmm. one hour. Yeah. Right? That amount of heat work is going to be different from my smaller kiln that goes from 2200 to 2000 in the course of 20 minutes yeah that's a whole 40 minutes of reactionary time for the glaze and the chemicals in the glaze that make it the way i want it to go Mm -hmm. right so there's definitely going to be a difference and to that degree some things in the glaze react to a further extent if you put them underneath longer terms of heat work some people put a slow cool on their kilns Mm -hmm. i love doing that but some of my matte glazes come out more matte with a slow cool because the alumina is allowed to develop and react with the amount of heat in there over a certain period of time. Right. And those are the kind of things that develop either microcrystals, like in essentially a matte glaze. Right. Or if you're doing like a actual crystal glaze. Don't most crystal glazes? Most of them. Have to have a slow cool? Dude, they do, cra- they do crazy holds in slow cools. Mm. I've seen potters do holds for like an hour at the top, a cone six or whatever, a cone ten. Uh-huh. I've seen potters do like a four hour hold Whoa. in between 17 and like 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, I'm using Fahrenheit. Suck it. <laughs> <laughs> But, like, it's it's actively insane. It, it yeah. really is crazy. Yeah. But the amount of energy, rather heat, mm-hmm. that is applied to the chemistry of your glaze matters even if it's still in the cooling down process and it's not around or even over the cone that you set it to. I know we're kind of going around in circles, but I just, I just want to get the, the minimal idea out that, like, heat work is not temperature. Heat work yeah. is essentially temperature with the amount of time it's it's... Yeah, it is kind of hard to to define, and I don't want to just like read off the definition on Sue's uh, on Sue's article. Temperature measures heat. Heat work measures heat plus things in physics, like how <laughs> <Yeah>. the. <laughs> 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 like, like how the, what the airflow is, uh, how much, what, like, what is the heat retention? How quickly is the heat? Your elements. How is it? How is the heat moving? Did you leave one of the plug holes open? Right. The way I generally look at it is like how much heat my piece is exposed to over a certain amount of time kind of equals heat work to me I think versus good... just the temperature. Yeah. And I think like the, the main reason that I feel like it's important to to that like why we're talking about this in the first place is that I think especially when or at least I'll say for myself when I first got my first kiln I was like really nervous that I was gonna mess something up yeah and I was fortunate that like I had already been volunteering at Sacramento City College for a while and I had been working with a studio technician there to learn 
about how to how to load a kiln, about like how to fire a kiln, about like some of the different things that even though the technician at the time didn't talk about it as heat work, that's essentially what I was learning how to do is how to try and get consistent heat work. Right. And I think if you tend to get different results with the same glazes in your kiln, I'll, I'll, I'll hazard a guess and say that that's most likely to do with heat work. Yeah. But the nice thing is, is that there's been a whole line of products developed to help measure heat work. There has. And what are those called, Dante? My eyes. Oh, no. They're my eyes. Pyrometric cones. Oh, pyrometric cones. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I was actually talking to, to a buddy of mine. Uh, shout out, Renout Browers. Right. But he's a buddy of mine who's taken way more chemistry mm-hmm. classes than I have. And he's, he's an aggressive tester. Right. Uh-huh. We were talking about glaze chemistry and, and he was talking about how like, well, technically speaking, you know, there's certain amounts of alumina and silica in a glaze and those are kind of meant for a specific cone. Mm-hmm. But realistically speaking, like they don't match up. Really, they, they start maturing like three or four cones beforehand. Mm. right so certain glazes look like chemically they're developed for like cone two Mm -hmm. really they're meant to be fired at cone five or six because if things actually melted at the proper temperature that you thought they melted at at a specific cone those little kiln sitters those little kiln watchers that we have Mm -hmm. the parametric cones they would just melt like if things really melted at cone six like the specific amount of temperature actually melted all the things in a cone six recipe at cone six you would have a puddle on the ground for your cone six oh kiln yeah, yeah yeah so yeah. the technically speaking those things aren't melting at cone six they start they, they're they like start they're, melting. They're, they're like mature they're maturing they're maturing at cone six yes okay okay that makes sense does that make more sense yes 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 yes, yes. yeah because it's not like because things can begin to melt earlier and that's why like certain things like fluxes right. lower the like the temperature at which the glazes start to melt yeah but they don't look like how you want them to look until cone six well that's the thing hypothetically my... you know and it's and same for whatever cone the glaze is made to mature at well that's the thing in my in my ceramic material workshop classes they showed us like here's the original cone chart here's what it's based off of so like this amount of alumina this amount of silica is for cone two and this is Mm -hmm. for cone three and here's the ratio of cone four five six and it keeps going up right Mm -hmm. and so when i look at a glaze recipe i'm like this looks like it's meant for cone two and that's Mm -hmm. weird and i asked him and he goes oh yeah no it starts melting at that temperature Mm -hmm. it starts to mature at that temperature it doesn't actually melt all the way fully at that temperature that's how cones are designed. Cones and yeah. cone watches are designed to start the chemical reaction at that temperature. They don't happen at that temperature. If they happened at that temperature, if they'd like completely finished and everything melted, if the ingredients melted at that degree, then you would, all your cone watchers and sitters would just be like puddles on the ground. Yeah. That's yeah. not how that works. And that took me so long to understand. Mm. Is that like, when I'm developing glazes, I look at the, the, the molar amounts and I'm like, why is this for cone three? But it says mm-hmm. it works at cone six. It starts reacting at cone three. Yeah. It's meant to mature at it will at other other cones. Yes, yes, yes. That makes sense. That makes sense. Right. But the benefit of using pyrometric cones is that pyrometric cones will better measure the heat work. When I was first introduced to pyrometric cones, I was kind of taught about them like they were a thermometer. Yeah. But they're not quite a thermometer because again, thermometer reads temperature. Right. But For instance, if you had a pyrometric cone and I was firing my work to, you know, cone six, but then placing a hold on it, that particular pyrometric cone would show up differently Mm -hmm. in a kiln with that hold versus without that hold. So even though, you know, the kiln says, oh yeah, we're firing to cone six, that pyrometric cone measures the heat work. And that is especially important, I think, if you are like, how do I say, <laughs> basically everyone will tell you that you should be using pyrometric cones in every load. <laughs> but nobody does. I mean, <laughs> some, people, some people do. I don't, I don't, but like, okay, okay. Here's the, here's the thing. I have not met a single person <sighs> in my life. It's like when you first get your kiln and they're like, yeah, you should fire your kiln empty so that you can have everything kind of settle in and fire it and make sure that nobody does that. I did that. I totally, really? I totally did that. What I fired, a nerd. I, followed, I fired all of my kiln furniture. I did follow the rules on that one i didn't but yeah but the, the i actually i so i stopped i was like i'm not an amateur i'm just gonna put it in. yeah <laughs> <laughs> why would i why would i read the, the average dad move right i'm not oh, reading yeah. the instructions i know how to do this oh yeah and then course. when you mess up you go back and read the instructions mm-hmm, you're like i should mm-hmm. probably should have probably read those yeah yep so the reason that i don't use pyrometric cones anymore like i used to but i don't anymore because 
I basically have been using the same glazes for so long that I can kind of tell when something is off. Yeah. And also you can, you can like, depending on what the potential problem is, you can get other sources of information that will tell you what the problem is. Like for instance, when my kiln elements were aging and then I also was having a a problem with my uh, thermocouple Mm -hmm. and then also my relay, it was like a whole thing. I had to, this is, this is like last year when my kiln like died and you basically saved my ass. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It was quite the, quite the thing. It was. But so I first kind of started noticing that there were issues with that because my glazes looked different Yeah. and particularly my Anne's bronze glaze, which is finicky and more likely to run. I noticed that it was showing things, you know, thing, the glaze itself was looking differently, different. And then when I went to look at my, at my kiln and it told me how long the firing took, I was like, whoa, like this firing took a lot longer than it should have. Like two hours more or some junk like something that. like yeah. that. Yeah. Which is again, an, another good thing to keep it, to keep track of. And again, this is something my, uh, mentor taught me when I was uh, volunteering and she was the studio technician is to, uh, well, she's good about this. She actually writes down the firing time of every single firing. Yeah. I don't do that, but I try and keep a general eye on like, all right, how long does like a medium speed firing take? Right. So I don't use pyrometric cones because I use the same glazes so much that when something is different, I like, I can tell like, okay, Something's different here. Yeah. What's what's going on? And I can troubleshoot from there. Yeah. But I would recommend that if you are if you are new to firing your own kiln, I would recommend using pyrometric cones because I think it can help you determine what's going on in your kiln. And if you're having issues with glazes, it can help you narrow down what the issues are. Like, is it that you need to adjust your specific gravity? Yeah. Is it that, you know, the viscosity is off? Or is it that your kiln is taking, you know, either too long or too short to, to fire something? I do. I do maybe... Once every four to five firings, mm-hmm. not including bisque. It's mainly just for glaze. Yeah. Because I bisque really low. I bisque at like zero eight. Oh, wow. That is a low bisque. Yeah. It's, it's the, like the temperature of 04 is like too close mm. for me at, to the higher temperatures. Yeah. Like I need it to be lower. You can probably handle your stuff just fine and glaze it. Because really, and I know this is a different topic. The reason we bisque our stuff is to drive off the water and make it more handleable to glaze. Because like you can't just dip greenware in a bucket full of water and minerals is going to like dissolve on you yeah it's going to like crumble in your hands so i mean i mean although some people some people do do single firing some people do glaze bisque ware yeah or sorry some people do glaze greenware some people glaze greenware but in my experience they're like glazing it with brushes Mm. they're generally not dipping but Mm. since we dip like i'm not getting greenware in tongs and dipping it in a bucket of like water and glaze i don't i've tried that once and Mm. it like i never got my pot back Oh, it just, it's, it dissolved. It dissolved. Yeah, Cause it's, yeah, yeah. it's water. Like yeah. that's what glazes are. They're water and minerals floating in water. They're minerals floating in water. There, there probably are ways to do it, but that is, uh, beyond our skill. <laughs> I mean, we, or at least that's not something that we've learned. It's not something I'd be interested in realistic. Like I probably yeah. figured out how to do it next month, but like, I don't want to. Yeah, like, that's fair. I don't want to. That being said, yeah, I probably, I'd probably do cones in my kiln once every four to five firings because like you were saying i have a good enough relationship with my kiln and my glazes to know that a glaze that usually i've developed comes out differently and i'm like okay that's not good yeah right something's off whether it be the clay and if i know it's not the clay and i know i weigh the specific gravity and i know it's at the right amount that i want it to be at mm-hmm. and i and i know how many layers and things of that nature then i really know it and the difference in heat work is primarily about the amount of heat that's left over residually after it fired to a full to a full cone five or six or whatever. Here's a good example. My Randy's red comes out actually red in my smaller kiln mm. because it ju- it gets to the amount that it needs to be and then it drops off, right? Mm. But in my bigger kiln, my Randy's red like drips and turns yellow Oof, most weird. of the time. But that's just that's just because it was designed to like mature at cone five or six at this color at this temperature. But it's getting too much heat. It's it's getting too much energy for the amount of time it's in the kiln. Mm-hmm. Even once it's reached cone six. It, the heat is still being applied to the product in the pot even after that point, the extra leftover heat work. Right? Yeah. I feel yeah. like the word heat work and residual heat can kind of be synonymous, but uh, with, I, I without like... like uh, I feel like residual heat is part of heat work overall. I feel like it's most but, of heat work. Well, no, because heat work also determine is is also based on like how quickly it, the the kiln the uh, temperature rises. That's true. As well. That's the other half. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's and fair. also how long it sits at that high temperature. That's very fair. And yeah. also how 
the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. air yeah. moves through the kiln. Like another thing is like if you have one of the kilns where it's like it sucks up air. Oh, the vent system. The vents, yeah, yeah. If it has a vents. Like that will also affect heat work because it's affecting how the air is moving in the kiln. Which is it's crazy. like it's like a convection oven versus like a regular oven. Yes, that is that is very true. Yeah, they work very differently. But yeah. I'm pretty aware of how my glazes ought to be, and the primary way I want them to to kind of be affected by the heat, so that if the heat work is off, I go, oh, okay. Yeah. Right. And they're, they're huge differences. Mm -hmm. They're huge differences. And I think my tester kiln is probably the biggest example because I test glazes at small batches and like 50 and 100 grams before I put in my big kiln. But I know for a fact they're going to come out a little bit better melted or the alumina is going to develop mm -hmm. a little bit better or the color is going to run a little bit more. Unle like, unless it's unless it's the Randy's red. And Apparently. <laughs> no, Randy's Randy's red specifically comes out different because of the heat work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah right. Yeah, but yeah. like. But like if I developed a glaze tomorrow and I tested it in my tester kiln, my brain goes 60 or 70% of this glaze is what it's going to be. But I bet it's going to melt a little bit more or mm. the, the alumina is going to develop a tiny bit more because of the heat work because the size of the kiln alone, not even the rest of that stuff, just the size of the kiln alone mm -hmm. is going to hold more heat at higher temperatures and that will affect the chemistry and the glaze itself. Like I'm, yeah. that's just obvious, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's usually how I think of heat work, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. But all, all the other factors are, I'm not going to lie to you, things I just don't even think about. That's fair. It's that's like, fair. It's like when I think about venting my kiln, mm -hmm. I'm not going to vent my kiln. <laughs> I'm not putting a vent on my <laughs> kiln. Oh, Dante, but you're going to get poisoned. No, I'm not. Yeah, Keep I Keep think... drinking your Pepsi, <laughs> drinking your Vicodin, I'll be all right. Oh my goodness, Sorry. so salty. Sorry. So salty. People are always like, the chemicals are going to gas off and they're going to kill you. And I'm like, you are, do you have any idea what you put in your body on a daily basis? Uh, be, be, do, I'm just saying, if you're going to be holier than thou, make sure you're going to church. Oh, oh okay. That's okay. all I'm saying. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think my my understanding is, I mean, again, with, 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 with kiln venting, my understanding is that there's not uh, sufficient evidence so at, right now to to say that it is unhealthy to like not vent your kiln if your kiln is firing inside yeah. and you are also inside. Right. Unless you have things that are like burning off. Like I know when I bur when I do a glaze firing, like I put wax uh, I use wax resist when I glaze, so I can smell that burning off. It smells off. so good, it smells though. so bad. What do you mean bad? Oh, my God. Anyway. I love the smell so, of it. The one from Imco, uh, not Amico, Imco, uh, smells slightly like mint to me. That's very odd. You're odd. You're odd. All right. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. We're both kind of strange. Yeah, we're both. Yeah. <laughs> we're both sussy baka. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I guess if we're going to do takeaways on this episode, I will say that some of the things that impact heat work in your kiln are going to be whether you have a small or large kiln, whether it's tightly packed or is loosely packed, uh, whether or not your kiln elements or thermocouple are, are aging because that can affect the firing time, whether you're firing with a hold and whether you're firing with like a slow cool or not. And there are other things again, like we were just talking about, yeah. you know, the vent. I mean, there are other things, but I'd say the biggest things to keep in mind are those things. And I think for most folks, it's starting out with do you have a small kiln or a large kiln? Because right. that's, again, when I... That's a big one for that's, me. Yeah, yeah. And when I... That was the biggest thing I noticed when I switched from having my work fired in the larger community kilns when I was at the the school right. versus having my own small Scut KM 818. Right. That was the biggest thing that changed at first. And and Huge. some glazes, you know, will show differences in heat work more than others. Yeah. But um, but I think those are, those are things to keep in mind and... Hopefully helpful and uh, use pyrometric cones. You know, do as we say, not as we do. But sure. uh, yeah, especially, sure. yeah. especially for beginners, you know, or for folks who are, uh, you know, new to firing their own kilns and using their own glazes, like use pyrometric cones because it will save you, uh, save you some help. And go read Sue McLeod's article about pyrometric cones Please. and Digital Fire's articles about pyrometric cones, which I will link in the show notes. Yeah, it's always it's always interesting to see some of my glazes that I develop that are on like the edge of too much. Or too little alumina. Mm. Because a good portion of the time, somebody will, will be like, hey, I have this matte glaze. It doesn't really turn out matte. But you and I both know that matte is really just the alumina developing and making like a sheet. Yeah. You know? So like most of the time, I'm like, yeah, just fire in a bigger kiln. Mm. Right? Like, fire, like get, give the alumina more time to develop at a lower temperature than the top temperature you're firing at. It'll probably come out more matte. And because of that simple fact alone, a lot of my glazes that are, have a little bit more alumina than silica in them... Mm -hmm will sometimes turn matte in my bigger kiln. Oh, when yeah, When I yeah. tested it in the small kiln, and it came out relatively glossy. Mm, right? I'm yeah, like, oh, yeah. wow, okay. I didn't know this was, like, on the cusp. 
That's so cool. I know, right? But it's just the change in, in it's just the change in heat work because of the size of the kiln. Yeah. It's yeah. not like I did anything to the glaze. I didn't change the clay or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, now that we've talked about heat work, do you want to talk a little bit about your news? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, a lot of you know that I've been trying to figure out ancient copper. And if you've been listening to the podcast for a bit, I, I've essentially figured out what it is. I've, mm-hmm. And that was the big thing for me. It's like the first two months I was like, maybe it's a tin chrome glaze, mm-hmm. which I hate, by the way. I hate tin chrome glaze. <laughs> I hate them so much. They're purple with extra steps. Um, and I was like, okay, well, it's not that. And then I thought it was a crystal glaze. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, okay, well, crystal glazes have a high amount of zinc in them. I've made crystal glazes before. I have a couple on my glazy profile for free. You can just have the recipes. Right? And then like... At a, after a certain amount of time, I was talking to, to a friend of mine, and he was like, oh, high levels of zinc and iron don't really like each other. That's why you don't mm. see a lot of red crystal glazes out in the market. Mm. And I was like, okay. so And a lot of my stuff just turned, like, matte yellow or brown mm-hmm. with a lot of zinc in it. So that yeah. was like two mo- that was two months of testing right there. Right, right. And then, so, you know, I kind of figured out sooner or later how to make a good oxidation red at cone six. Yeah. Like, I finally figured it out. And then after that, I had to figure out what made the crystals. And then Mm -hmm. I figured that out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? And so I now have, because I figured out what's in those glazes. The messed up part is I told Tim C. Like, I showed him a picture. I didn't tell him anything else about it. And he, two seconds later, told me. He's like, oh, yeah, that's this kind of glaze. And I was Ah! like, you mother effer. (laughs) (laughs) He's just been been in the game so long that I think he just knows. He can look at something and be like, oh, that's this type of glaze. Yeah. But I worked backwards. I developed a glaze. And then I was like, I wonder if this has been developed by anybody else Mm -hmm. in the world. And of course they have. The world's a big place. Yeah. And so I looked it up and I was like, okay, so I'm clearly developing this type of glaze. Right. And then I learned stuff about that type of glaze. So the big news for me personally is that uh, essentially a company took notice. I'm not going to say what company yet. And it seems like they want to sell my recipe to people who don't put glazes together themselves. Yay! Right? So like a glaze a, a glaze company or a clay company essentially said like, hey, you have a glaze. We want to sell it. We want to give you dividends from the sales of it. So essentially people who want to buy like a powdered version of your glaze. Of Dante's whatever. Of Dante's whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I already signed an NDA to not tell anybody the recipes. And that's, we'll talk about that in a second. That's for a very specific reason. Uh, and then they now have the glaze recipes. They have three of them. So cool. Uh, and the, I don't, I don't even know if I can talk about the deals because I'm under NDA, but they uh-huh. essentially are testing them right now. Yeah. And then they figure out how much they are and how much they're worth and how much they're going to sell them for based on the ingredients. Mm-hmm. And then they have a certain percentage quarterly they're going to give me based on the sales. Yeah. X, y, Z. But right now we're in the testing phase. That's a big deal. I think I can tell you guys at least one of the glazes that they obviously wanted the ancient copper glaze. Yeah. So they yeah. they took that. They have the yeah. recipe to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and they also took Dante's Gara's red, mm. my red glaze, because evidently they didn't have a good sustainable red glaze. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, well, I have like five. You can have one. Yeah. Right. You just buy one for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, no big deal. Big That's deal for so me. So awesome, dude. I might be getting dividends off of if you guys want to buy. My glaze is pretty soon. I don't think it'll happen in like the next month or so. Yeah, we'll 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 definitely, you know, I'm sure you'll be sharing it on your YouTube and we'll share it here. Yeah. When when more of the details come out that you can share. Right. But like the fact that essentially you're you have an exclusive deal with a glaze making company. Right. To have glazes that you have developed, you have researched, you have done all this stuff for. Right. And then now you're essentially gonna be getting paid for that work that you've done because right. They're going to be making your glaze available for people to buy. Right. And that's huge. And here, here's the other thing. And here's here's the bigger part for me. Because, like, I could have done that in private and not said anything. Mm-hmm. And then sooner or later you would have figured out, this looks a lot like your glaze. And I was like, oh, yeah, it is my glaze. Yeah. A company sells it and gives me a little bit of money. Um, I've essentially kind of decided, and we've talked, to, we were talking about this in the car, to kind of, like, keep a lot of my recipes private. This is... Only because I used to be a very communal source for recipes. I used to share all the recipes and all my research and all of this and all of that. And I used to kind of share it all the time. But throughout going through this process and kind of realizing some stuff, I realized that not only will people who just like glaze recipes, but also companies will like 100% just take a glaze and morph it a little bit. Yeah. And then sell it as their own thing. Yeah. Which is rough because that's like I get... at somebody's work. Yeah. Yeah. That's somebody's proprietary information that they shared with you and hoped you wouldn't abuse, and then you did abuse it, <laughs> right? So it's 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 very much in my interest to safeguard a lot of my glazes. Now that being said, I'm still going to release glazes and information, mm-hmm. right? But like 
for every four glazes I develop, I'm keeping three of them now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. To that point, there's definitely people on Glazy, which is where I hold most of my recipes, who just take my glazes Mm -hmm. and will copy them and put them in their own profile. Yeah. And sometimes without credit. I've seen about four or five profiles. So messed up, Some of them will even take my pictures and just post them on their profile. Like, I just want this glaze to exist forever here, and I want to make sure you can never take it down, so I'm just going to put it in my file where you don't have control. And I'm like, oh. One person did that, specifically. Yeah, that's... that's... And I was like, well, I said I was going to take it down, and then you copied it, so now I can't. I mean, yeah, I can't really take it out anyway because the way Glazies works, but it's kind of a messed up move. I kind of didn't want you to do that. Not yeah. only that, other people have made revisions of my glaze and they'll change the minerals over just a little bit mm-hmm. and then they will call it their own. They'll, they'll name it something different and call it their own. Yeah. Thankfully for me, thankfully, these people are really bad at putting together glazes. <laughs> um, and most of their testers come out brown. Mm-hmm. Most of them. Because... They don't follow my blog where I, mm. I kind of tell people how I put together my glazes. Yeah. Like I have a certain amount of things I do to make my glazes the way I like them. Yeah. And people seem to like that, but mm-hmm. they're not willing to, you know, I'm trying to be nice about it, but some people just be putting minerals in a jar, putting a random amount of water in there and shaking it up and then being like, your glaze is bad. Yeah. No, brother. No. You're just cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> You're just cheeks. Uh, I remember a very specific conversation and I think we've had this conversation before. Where somebody contacted me and they're like, I made your glaze. It turned out brown. And I go, okay, how much water did you put in there? And he's like, what does that have to do with anything? And I'm like, okay, what's the specific gravity? And he goes, I don't know what that is. Mm. Does that really matter that much? And I said, yeah, it matters a lot. Yeah. What clay body did you use on? And he goes, does that matter? And I was like, yes, all these things matter. Mm-hmm. What's the viscosity? You know? And he goes, oh, I, well, I use rainwater. That might be it. And I was like, "It no. Mm. He goes, yeah, a po- another potter told me. And I was like, I've done so much testing that I don't, I don't use bottled water. I don't use purified, distilled rain. I use yeah. Sacramento tap water, my G. Yeah. And it, all my glazes work out fine. And I've made glazes in other parts of the world. They work out fine there too, as long as you're not using like Flint, Michigan water. <laughs> you're good, right? So thankfully, a lot of these people that try to duplicate my recipes and just change them out a little bit and make like their own versions of them don't really follow the rules that I've kind of laid down for the glaze, which I generally put in the notes. Yeah. But because of people like this, if you're like, oh man, you should share your glaze recipes. It's really sad that you don't anymore. I thought you would always. This, a couple people in the ice cream and now we can't eat around it. <laughs> yeah. Can't just take it out the ice cream. Yeah. Yeah. You're it's... not, we're not eating the ice cream. We're now, no one can have ice cream. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I think that, I mean, again, I think it would actually be interesting. I don't think we've done this already, but it'd be interesting to do an, a full episode on like when to do things for free right. and when not to, because I think like, again, like I said, when you first told me this is like, you already do so much free stuff for the community that I think, especially with, with how much work you have put into this yeah it makes sense that you should get paid for your work my blogs alone are going hard right now like yeah. the amount of research i the amount of research i do and then transfer it onto my website and put it as a blog would have been a godsend to me like three years ago yeah, yeah. right and so like i put all the information of how i make my glazes anyway mm-hmm. and it's not like it's special it's not like i'm using yak milk and i'm like that's <laughs> that's the secret yak ingredient milk. guys I, <laughs> I use yak milk in my glazes, and that's what makes them all extra good. Like, no, I'm using tap water. Yeah. I'm using the same minerals that you can get your hands on or order online or from a mineral company. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the company I get them from. You can get the same exact minerals as I have, right? You can mix them up. I barely sieve my glazes anymore. I use a blender now. Like, you can do exactly all the stuff that I do, but you got to do it how I tell you to do it. Otherwise, it's going to come out bad, Mm -hmm. you know? And I will say I'm a little bit peeved that some people are like, these recipes aren't good. And I'm like, and then I talk to them. Yeah. I usually try and like help them out just for mm-hmm. free. I'm not charging them or nothing. And it always ends up, they're just like, they don't know how to put a glaze together. Yeah. Yeah. They to just me, don't. To me, there's like, like I get, I get it if kind of like if you don't know any better, but it is to me, what can sometimes be frustrating is when, and not to say that everyone's doing this by any means, right. but like to me, there's a difference between like, Hey, like this glaze didn't work out versus you made a bad glaze. Right. Because it's like, Hey, this glaze didn't work out. Like, what what other things could be impacting how the glaze is turning out? The frustrating like, thing to me is that, like you're the variable uh, yeah. here, but like you refuse to think like maybe it's just me. Like it is, but if I say that, you're like, nah, it can't be me. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I I think it's really exciting. Like this is this is a big professional step for you, dude. And like, I'm very excited. Yeah. Hear me out. Okay. This is like, this is like you and I have the same recipe to a cake. Mm-hmm. But your cake came out bad. It did. And my cake came out good. So good. But we figured out that we followed. We did the same recipe. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the only logical conclusion here yeah. <laughs> is that one of us is a bad baker. <laughs> Oh, no. Know what I mean? Because maybe it's the heat work in the, in the, the oven. <laughs> <laughs> maybe my oven's just bad. Well, oh, my God. Low key, though, I actually do feel like getting to know a kiln kind of reminds me a little bit about, like, getting to know an oven. Because, like, whenever yeah. I'm at somebody's house and I'm, like, I don't know, going to be going to be, like, making something, I always bake chocolate chip cookies first because like i've made enough chocolate chip cookies that for the most part i kind of know like all right i know how these should look yeah at this thing and i also know that my oven at home is about 25 degree 25 to 50 degrees higher yeah than whatever knob i set it to because my my oven's super old and probably giving me cancer um <laughs> the lead the lead no not the lead just the i don't even know right but but yeah but i think kilns and heat work can sometimes be similar depending on all the things that we talked about before but uh honestly the heat work from a kiln and the heat work from an oven are, are pretty they're different temperatures of course. yeah yeah yeah. but yeah. like the concepts are, are similar the concepts are similar in the way that they affect food and i think the cookie yeah. example is perfect because like i put my cookies in for like 10 minutes mm-hmm. at 400 something degrees based on the recipe i'm using at any given time keep in mind i was a chef before <laughs> i was a chef like a year ago yeah so and then i like i turned it off. Mm-hmm. I turn the oven off, and I let the residual heat work affect the rest of the reactions in the in the food, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that continues to cook the cookies over time. Yeah. Even the heat that's coming from the bottom of the tray, if you took the cookies all the way out. That's. I was gonna say that one of my favorite uh, cookie recipes that I always make during the fall is like a molasses spice cookie. Yeah. And it like it definitely says like yeah when you pull them out of the oven they're gonna look almost underdone but leave them on the baking sheet for five minutes before yep. taking them off and like yeah that residual heat will continue to cook the cookies. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's crazy. Yeah. It's almost like it's like chemistry in the kitchen. No, no, I want some cake. We can't. We just had so much food. Cake! And that's it for today. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of The Mud Peddlers. We would love to hear from you. So if you want to share your thoughts about the episodes or just see what Dante and I are working on in our studios, come say hi. You can find links to my social media at lindsaymdillon.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y, M as in monster, D-I-L-L-O-N.com. And you can visit my pottery shop or see what I'm working on at earthnationceramics.com. And you can find me all over social media at Earth Nation Ceramics. It's spelled exactly how you think it's spelled. And if you want to support the show, hear some bonus episodes, and see some behind the scenes of my work, you can support me and the show at patreon.com slash Dylan. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next time. Thank you.